This program is brought to you by the partners of A Root Awakening International. Help others find truth. Support A Root Awakening International today. Was the Yom Kippur War a fabricated exercise for political gain? Bruce Burrell reveals jaw-dropping evidence about anti-Semitism inside the NSA, including a Jew room, and why Israeli intelligence prefer to ignore their own information and trust American intelligence instead, which led to disaster. Because it's the end of the sixth day, the sun is set, and this is Shabbat Night Live. Well, Shabbat Shalom, Torah fans. Welcome to Shabbat Night Live with Michael Rood. Yes, it's true, the NSA had a Jew room or set of Jew rooms in the 1970s where Jews were not allowed. Why? What was going on in there? And did discussions in those rooms have anything to do with the sabotage we learned about last week, better known as the Yom Kippur War? Well, Bruce Brill brings us the details and our Passover event is next week. Let's talk about that with Michael Rood himself. Oh, Welcome, sir. Thank you, Scott. Our Passover is completely sold out. We filled up the entire room, and so anyone who wants to be in on the festivities has to go to and be uh, go online with it. And uh, I talked with Nehemiah last night, and Nehemiah and I are going to do a very special teaching. I've been waiting over a year. Uh, the, the last conversation I had with him before I had the stroke, uh, we, we, I knew I had to do this teaching, and that is what kept me alive for the last year. So we're gonna do that, and, and it's gonna be very important that everyone gets to see this. So sign up now for Passover of 2023. Thank you. All right, well, by the way, are we gonna get any kind of hint? Are you gonna give me a hint or no? No, I don't <laughs> think so. Okay. I, I, I think I better keep it a secret. You're okay. gonna keep it a secret, okay. So people have to tune in next week. Yeah. And it's gonna be? They have to sign up for it. Have to sign up for Passover. Yeah, okay. because we're gonna do things on it that are illegal for uh, uh uh, YouTube and oh, okay. things like that. So this is so we're going to do something very special. So it's a touchy subject. Not going to be on YouTube. So are we going to put it on the Michael Rood app? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's going to be on the so, app. So so people okay. need to sign up for the Passover event now. Okay, very good. All right, so we'll do that. Sign up for Passover there. And by the way, so when Jake Hilton, let's talk about Jake Hilton for a minute. Yeah. Uh, this fellow came to us. Uh, he did this whole six episode series on. Um, Mormonism. Yes, it was very good. Yeah, and I understand that Anna Lil, your wife, really enjoyed that. Yeah, we, we talked about it, and what came to my mind was that verse in the Bible, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Uh, the word precious doesn't mean, oh, how sweet. <laughs> it means costly. Mm. It cost God something to, for that whole thing to happen, and it cost Jake his whole life, and uh, for for over 200 years, they were part of the Mormon church and his family. And Jake, Jake when he, when, when, unless people get the video, they don't have the information. And so we want people to get the video to show to their children and their grandchildren because nobody needs to go through it again because Jake did already. That's he, right. He, 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 it cost him his entire life and the life of his family to be able to do what he did. So we want everybody to get that and to, uh, to archive it mm -hmm. so they have his testimony because uh, like when my wife saw it, she said, that is the reason why I left Catholicism even though the name of it is Why Left Mormonism, because Jake found the, 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 uh, 
the, the Feast of the Lord series, and that's what changed his life. And even though I know very little about Mormonism, I do know about the Bible. And so that is a very important thing for people to get that and to pass that on so they don't get caught up in all the tricks and all the deceit that is part of the religious establishment. So in, in a way, I guess Mormonism, just like Catholicism, has its own, uh, ten, its, uh, its own ma'asim and they uh, talk a note, really. Yeah, yeah they, they very much do. They're very much like that. And so when, when you learn the truth, that, that's what we specialize in here, is that we teach the truth and that then people can apply it in their own lives to whatever they are in, they, they come out of it because they know the truth and the truth sets them free from everything. Yeah, absolutely. And I love the fact that he found that, <laughs> that series of yours from way back when. Oh yeah, uh, it's because Nehemiah and I went out to Salt Lake City and we taught in the, in the church out there and in the, where, where people could get the videos and then I went out and I, I lived with a polygamous couple and, and I, I taught at the school and they interrupted the entire school and shut it down and they had an assembly and I taught at the assembly and because of that, uh, all my work went out all over, all over the Mormon world. Really? When what? I never even heard this story before. When was that? Oh, well, that was fascinating. Is that was back at twenty years ago, some kind of thing? Yeah, it was quite a while ago. Really? And you and Nehemia went out and did this. Yeah. Really? Wow. Yeah, we were on the radio, and people came out, and and in the hotel where we spoke, we there was over four hundred people there, all from uh, what was right behind us was a Mormon temple. Mm. And so they all came out and filled up the place. It was filled to overflowing. And that, that's, and that's when somebody got the, the video on the Feast of the Lord, and Jake saw that, and it changed his life. Oh, so that's the backstory. So did you hear this from, you got this from Jake when he came to visit us? No, I, I knew that. You knew this already, okay. Wow, yeah, because that's how it happened. He went to a friend's house who had the video. He didn't even have the video. He went to a friend's house. They were both working for the Mormon church and uh, basically defending its tenets. And they were going to have a meeting about what they were going to do next, and he saw it on the shelf there on his friend's house. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's why we want people to get Jake's, uh, get the videos on the feast and, and the Jonah Code and get the, feed, uh, the the video on Jake's testimony. Absolutely, very important. Now, yeah, it is. So next week, Passover, you're going to be here. Oh, yeah. Very excited. And Nehemiah will be here and too. Him, of course, yes. He, he's part of the instigation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I spoke to him, he was at the Vatican. Oh, wow. And he's gonna be here right fresh from the Vatican, and we're gonna do this teaching that is so important that, that, that we've been talking about it for over a year now. Oh, wow. Well, I can't wait. Well, thank you for joining us today, Michael. We'll see you next week at Passover. <laughs> well, like thank Mike, you. Like Michael said, go, up and, uh, go ahead and sign up, and uh, we will see you as well. All right, so next, Bruce Brill, friend of Michael Rood's, by the way, reveals jaw-dropping evidence about anti-Semitism inside the NSA, including a Jew room. It's the second and final episode of Israel and the Deep State. But first, get your bread and wine ready with Michael. Coming up. In Matthew's account of the gospel, Yeshua says that we are the light of the world. But in some parts of the world, the darkness we are to expose is more intense than we can imagine. Making the gospel relative, I don't believe, is conducive to making disciples. We're not supposed to be relative. We're supposed to be set apart. We're supposed to be the answer to a lost and dying world. Sharing experiences about his work to bring the Torah to Native American people here at home and to enslaved young women in the darkest reaches of India and Pakistan, Rodney Thompson brings a wake-up call 
to apathetic believers in Dealing with Darkness. Dealing with Darkness is our gift to thank you for supporting A Root Awakening International. When you donate $50 to this ministry in March, we'll send you Dealing with Darkness on DVD or Blu-ray. Donate $100 and we'll send you Dealing with Darkness plus an olive wood mezuzah from Israel featuring the Shema in Hebrew and English inscribed both on the wood and written on a scroll inside. Donate $300 and we'll send you three gifts. Dealing with Darkness, the olive wood Shema mezuzah plus a 10 inch decorative butterfly bowl featuring vibrant hand-painted artwork by artists in Israel. These gifts are a limited time offer from Michael Rood to thank you for your support. Make your donation today and receive the $50 gift, the $100 gift, or the $300 gift. Get these exclusive thank you gifts when you make a donation to support A Rood Awakening International in March. Call 888-766-3610 or get your gifts online with a donation at monthlylovegift.com. On the morning that the Passover lambs were selected, there were two loaves that were put on the wall of the temple. When the first one was removed, after that, no more leavened bread was eaten. When the second loaf was removed, then all of the leavened bread in the land of Israel was then burned because the Feast of Unleavened Bread was going to commence at sunset that evening. The night before, Yeshua took Artos. He took leavened bread and he blessed the Most High in the presence of his disciples and he interpreted the Kadosh Mikra, the holy rehearsal that Melchizedek put in place with Abraham. Yeshua said the prayer of the Melech Zadik, Baruch Atah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech HaAlam, Hamotzi Lechem Haaretz. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he said, this represents my body, which is now broken for you. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Then Yeshua took the cup and he said, Baruch Atah, Yehovah, Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, Borei Pri Hagafen. Blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, the King of the universe, creator of the fruit of the vine. And then he said, you take my cup, divide it among yourselves. I will not drink a sip of the fruit of the vine till I drink it with you in my Father's kingdom. So as often as we do this now, we rehearse not only his death, but we rehearse that we will be at the marriage supper of the lamb and at the marriage supper of the lamb, he will take his cup and say, Lahaim to life everlasting. And until then, Shabbat Shalom. We live in an age where information is suppressed, information that needs to come out and will finally reveal what everyone had always assumed in the first place. Some call it the beach ball effect. You have this information pushing it like a beach ball into the water, but that can only hold for so long and eventually that information comes out. Well, Bruce Brill has written a book called An Ally's Deceit about a beach ball that has been held under the water for some 50 years, and Bruce, welcome back to Shabbat Night Live. Thank you, Scott. Um, I just want to correct you. Um, the title of the book was An Ally's Deceit, but it was changed by the publisher to Deceit of an Ally. Ah, thank you. Yes, I have old information here. There it is right there. Deceit of an ally. Now, Michael Root is in the studio with us today, and he said, you know, an interesting thing about Bruce is that, you know, he helped us with the calendar. He cited the new moon. That's the, the affinity you had with Michael when you first met. And he told me you had built a house that 
had an open roof so that you could sight the new moon? Tell us about this weird house. Okay, not, <laughs> not, not only did it have an, does it have an open roof, the open roof was built to accommodate a string of rotors, wind rotors, Savonius open S rotors, if any of your listeners know anything about uh, primitive windmills, based on the, um, an American idea that was used particularly in Kansas and Nebraska, They're called the American Jumbos. But I combined the open S rotor or the Savonius rotor to the American Jumbo idea and set them along a horizontal line, which, well, I don't want to go into uh, the details. I'll be here for three hours <laughs> talking to you about uh, wind technology. But to make uh, the connection with new moon sightings, the winds, the predominant winds in Tokoa come from the west. So the line of the rotors were north-south, facing the west. And so the ridge of the roof also faced the west. So it was ideal. You stood behind the ridge of the roof. It would shield all the lights from below, you know, man-made lights, so that you can see the horizon very clearly. And it was a great place to sight new moons from. And as a matter of fact, Tokoa, I believe, getting back to new moon sightings, I think it was one of the prime places for sighting new moons in biblical times. Why do I think this? Because we are in Tokoa, just east of the mountain ridge. Meaning during the winter, when the clouds come from the west, the rain clouds, and they uh, hit the ridge, once they get over the ridge, it's clear. So you can actually see the sky to the west. To the west of the ridge, it's usually fogged in very often during the winter. So that's why I believe that Tokoa was a good place to sight new moons from, and that's where Tokoa got its name. Because when a sighter viewed the new moon, how would they communicate the fact that they sighted a new moon to Jerusalem? Blowing a shofar. And in Hebrew, to blow a shofar is called tekoa. Litkoa. Litkoa means to blow a shofar. And that's why I think tekoa got its name. Makes sense. And I, I remember from uh, the Day of Trumpets, uh, tekia. Is that, is that a related word? Tekia is the noun of uh, the actual blowing. Ah, okay. Right, right. The verb is mitkoa, to blow a shofar. Very good. All right, well, thank you. There, there's the mystery of Bruce Brill's roofless house. <laughs> and when last we spoke, uh, if you saw last week's episode, uh, you know that Bruce wrote a book. Uh, Br Bruce, you have that book beside you there? Why don't we hold that up again? As a deceit of an ally, as opposed to the previous topic or previous uh, uh, title that I had here. But now, when you first wrote this book, you took us back and there's information that you put in there. Uh, it was very highly sensitive information. Uh, you were surprised that the Pentagon signed off on it, not once, but twice. And then, I, I'm wondering, did any kind of doubt ever set in? Did you start to get afraid for your life that maybe they just approved it so they could come after you for it? No, I, I was actually paranoid. I even wrote a couple chapters in, in the book about my paranoia. Um, before I got the approval. When, when I got the approval, I just felt a, a tremendous release. And I thanked them so much, the people there. Actually, 
So I don't know if I can release her name, but I, I can release her last name. The lady who was the coordinator of the review, her last name was Schwartz. So after the review was done, I was just dying to know, are you Jewish? No, she's German, of, you know, German extraction. And she really um, was very kind through the whole review process to put my fears and my paranoia to rest. And I, I just felt release after they approved it. It still seems strange to me that they did approve it. Do you still shake your head and go, why, why are they allowing this to come out? I don't know. I, I think there's a lot of movement within the government to clean dirty stuff up. Even, even uh, Donald Trump, in his recent uh, announcement for the 2024 presidency, he remarked that he feels his job is to clean up deep corruption in the government. And this is just another example, but this is a, a terribly deep. You know, they talk about um, the, uh, what do they call it? Um, the, the shadow government, the deep state, the deep state. What I'm talking about is very deep state. Why? Because Eli Zaira, General Eli Zaira, when I was sitting across the table from him, I asked him, how could it be that a lowly soldier in the American intelligence knew days in advance knew it for certainty, knew the day it was going to happen, but you, a general, the head of Israel, military intelligence, was convinced that the Arabs were not going to attack. I mean, how could it be? So he asked me if I had any idea. And I said, I do. I do, because when I worked there, I was transferred to the special Arabic department, namely Hebrew. Hebrew was known in the 60s as special Arabic. Any Hebrew linguist, if they were asked what language you work in, they would have to say special Arabic, because it's not nice to spy on a friend. But already in the 70s, that became like a joke because everybody spies on everybody except America, Great Britain, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, don't spy on each other. They, they belong to a group of uh, intelligence sharers but every other country spies on every other country. So it, it doesn't have to be a secret that we spy on Israel. In fact, in the special Arabic department, there was an Orthodox Jewish girl that worked there. Because it's just something you do. It's not really spying, it's information gathering. <laughs> <laughs> sure, <No>. whatever. <laughs> whatever. Semantics, <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so, when I was working in the Hebrew section... Special Arabic. They were, right. They, they were a very, very nice group of people. Very nice. It was, it was a pleasure to work there. Um, as a matter of fact, one of the, the girls who was working there as a Hebrew linguist... Uh, got engaged, and we had an engagement party, and we went out to a, uh, a, a, a beer restaurant uh, place, and that supervisor of the special Arabic got soused. And 
they began talking shop outside of the agency, which is a big no-no. And especially for him, he was the head. And he takes his finger and violently points to me and pokes me and says there are departments in NSA that I, you, he's talking, you can't get into because you're a Jew. When the alcohol goes in, the truth comes out. And I believe he was a good person. He became a friend of mine. He came to my wedding. He held one of the corners of the chuppah. So I believe he was a good person and his conscience was bothering him about these rooms that not only a Jew can't have entry into, but are secret within the agency. So when I say there's deep state and there's very deep state, this is what I'm referring to because it's unknown. Who knows about it? The president of the United States probably doesn't know that there are rooms within NSA that were off limits to Jews and secret at the time. Do they still exist today? I don't know. I haven't walked into uh, NSA for uh, 48 years. But John Loftus, who is a non-Jew, who is the head of the Holocaust uh, Center in St. Petersburg, Florida, he wrote a book called The Secret War Against the Jews. And he speaks about these rooms within NSA that he says work against Israel. And he says more than that. He says they work against American Jews. You can pick up his book, The Secret War Against the Jews. You can get it on Amazon. It came out, I believe, in 96. And he documents that these rooms exist and they have a name. It's called the Jew Room. And he says it's a misnomer because, number one, Jews are not allowed to know that it exists or entry. And it's not one room. It's a complex of rooms. So there is active or assumed active anti-Semitism in NSA? Was. I don't know. I, I can't say is, mm. but I can say was. I sure, for sure can say was. Now, John uh, Loftus had written a, a review of your book and he said, Bruce Brill is Henry Kissinger's worst nightmare. Why would he say something like that? <laughs> I'm glad you asked because it brings up a, a, a finger of God topic. I play music and I play with some people in Tokoa, and I called one lady who is a, a singer in our group, and a guy answers the phone. And I s s asked for uh, the, the lady, and he says, listen, I found this phone in Jerusalem. Do you know who it belongs to? And I said, yeah, of course. And we arranged that I would pick up the phone. Okay, all this is uh, background. So I pick up the phone from this young man. He's maybe in his late 30s. And I don't know what, what brought me to ask him. And this is like mm, maybe three months ago or four months ago. I asked him, would you buy a book that discloses the truth behind the surprise of the Yom Kippur War? And he said, no, I, I didn't want to hear that. But he says, but 
My father wrote a book that has been suppressed for 45 years. His father wrote a book in 1978 disclosing the truth <clears throat> behind the Yom Kippur War surprise. He says, come to my house, I'll give you a copy. <clears throat> this is the book, been totally suppressed you can't find it anywhere for 45 years. And it's called Hakesher Hamirubah. Hakesher Hamirubah, which means the squared connection, meaning four corner connection. And what are the four corners? Well, Sadat and Assad, of course, you know, the, the presidents of Syria and Egypt, Brezhnev and the Soviets, Henry Kissinger, and why is Henry Kissinger here with these? He said that Assad and Sadat was saying in public pronouncements again and again and again after 1967 that the occupied territories that were occupied by Israel that were taken by force will be returned to them by force. That they won't accept them as a gift from the Israelis. They have to re have them returned by force. So Kissinger had the bright idea. How can we bring permanent, long-lasting peace to the Middle East? We have to have these territories returned to the Egyptians and the Syrians by the Israelis. But wait, it has to be by force. So he had the bright idea. Henry Kissinger, Mr. Bright Idea Man, to stage a war, an orchestrated war. And he got the Soviets to coordinate this. But wait, that's only one, two, three points of the square. What's the fourth point? Golda Meir and Moshe Dayan. He says, they were collaborators to arranging an orchestrated war. But Henry Kissinger was the bad guy. He's the one who arranged all this. Wow. All right, well, Bruce, we're gonna come back in a second. We're talking about some pretty uh, deep stuff here, if you will. The deep state, arranged wars, Soviets, Kissinger, Jew rooms, all kinds of interesting stuff going on here. So thank you for joining us and thank you for supporting Shabbat Night Live. It's because of you that we can get this message out and this is obviously a message that needs to get out. And we ask now that you would support us again so that we can get this out into the future to other folks, to other generations, so that they know what happened before because if we don't learn from our mistakes, what happens? We repeat them again. So let's learn from our mistakes. Let's make sure this message gets out. We need your support to do it. Thank you for doing it.
Hey, thank you for supporting Shabbat Night Live. This information is really important to get out. Your support makes all of this happen. Uh, we don't want it suppressed. Bruce, before the break, we were talking about this book that you had that was suppressed. You had a happenstance, miraculous thing happen. You happen to get a copy of this book. And uh, it ends up that uh, you were telling me during the break, you actually became friends with the author. Right, right, right. An 80-year-old man who is uh, he's an engineer by uh, profession and uh, is a lovely, like a delicate man. But what he reports, and I, I took a, uh, an investigative reporter, Steve Rodan, to meet him. And Steve says, this is uh, very, very important. And the author gave me permission to have his book published. And I want to have it translated into English because I think Americans need to hear about these, this dirty stuff that Henry Kissinger, you know, the, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. He might have had good intentions, but he brought about a hell for Israel. 2,800 Israelis were killed unnecessarily, unnecessarily because of Henry Kissinger's insane plan to stage a war. So that's what we're saying here, really, is this, the Yom Kippur War was a staged war. That, and this right, is, according, according to this. And then we get into the information that you had found, that there's not only misinformation, there's direct and deliberate disinformation that leads to these deaths. It, I told you I got this book about three months ago. <laughs> uh, I plow through Hebrew. I'm, I'm now right at the very end. I'm, I have two more pages to read, but it's taken me three months to get there. And what did I read on these last pages that Golda Meir went to the White House after the war to meet personally with Nixon? And what does he say she said? He says she said that she complained about misinformation that the CIA gave to Israeli intelligence. Totally confirming everything that I've been telling you that's in this book. Now let's talk about that for a second. You, you said a, a colloquialism there. He said, she said. So. This is not the opinion of one guy, Bruce Brill. Take us back to when you were with the NSA. You are not the only one who knew about this, were you? Right, okay, so I became friends with a, lo a lot of guys that became Arabic linguists. In, in our Arabic language class, there were 10 people and we were together for six hours a day and then we had different cultural events, and, um, and these cultural events included learning how to cook Arabic cuisine and going to different um, performances of Arabic music. So we, we got to know each other pretty well, six hours a day, every day for 47 weeks. So I became friends with some of the guys in the class, close friends. And uh, one of them, who's I mentioned, who I mentioned in the book, but not by name. He said, "Don't mention my name," because he has a publishing company, and basically he put my book out under a, the name of a different uh, publisher. But it's basically him, and he confirms everything that I'm saying. There was another fellow who was a pastor who worked in NSA <clears throat> who said that he knew a day before I knew. Uh, the fellow who put the book out, helped me get the book up on Amazon, he said he knew close to two weeks before. And then there's a 
another fellow, a third fellow that wasn't in the army, he wasn't in my class, he was uh, an Air Force guy. Uh, Presidio, by the way, Dillywick was a mixed services base. We had a sailor in our class and um, all, all the rest were army, but we had a, one sailor in our class. But in the, the section, there were Marines and sailors and Air Force as well. So this other fellow, uh, and he allows me to mention his name, David Gillespie, who wrote a book also about this. He knew about a week in advance. He was stationed in Northern England. Um, I, I don't remember the name of the place, but I think I'm not allowed to say it anyway. And the fellow who helped me get the book out, uh, he was stationed in Germany. Okay, so that's three guys that not only knew what I knew, but knew before I knew. There was a fourth guy. And this is another reason that I went back to the Pentagon to have them give a, an additional review because I wanted to include his story. He wasn't in NSA in the complex. He wasn't at a collection site in Berlin or in Northern England. He was out in the field. He was in the army from 71 to 74, just like I was. He also was in USASA, United States Army Security Agency. But he wasn't a linguist. He was a intelligence gathering specialist. He spent a year in Vietnam. And then he was restationed in Germany, in Augsburg. And he said, during 73, the February uh, maneuvers were just exercises. The May maneuvers were just exercises. But in October, his whole group was repositioned from Germany to Italy to get ready for the Yom Kippur War that was about to happen. Hmm. He asked his supervisor, are we sharing this intelligence with our Israeli friends. And his, his supervisor said, it's not your job to ask. Hmm. And during the war, when they were collecting real time evidence, he asked again, aren't we at least passing this to our friends, the Israelis? And his officer said again, not your job to ask. He was so troubled by this that when he got out of the army and he went back to Texas, eventually he converted to Judaism and he immigrated to Israel. Now it would be about 17 years ago. And two and a half years ago, well, actually three years ago, his wife died. And two and a half years ago, he began seeing women on a uh, dating site. And he came to visit my sister, who was living in Tekoa. And I met him at my sister's place. They, they didn't hit it off, but I hit it off with him because we shared so much. And he, his story, I said, this is unbelievable. I want to include your story in my book. So that was a second reason that I went back to the Pentagon to ask them to give a review. There was a third reason as well. An Israeli friend of mine said, Bruce, you got to take a look at a YouTube that I just watched. It, they interviewed Shmulek Pfefferman. He was just a soldier from the ranks, just like I was, but he was a, uh, a kashav, a, um, he was monitoring Syrian communication, Syrian military communication. And the day before the war, 
he got three intelligence points that indicated that they were going to attack the following day. I said, this is unbelievable. So did you send it to headquarters? He says, yes, I sent it to headquarters. They should have known. They should have known 24 hours bef before the attack began. Israel had plenty of its intelligence signs that an attack was imminent. But Eliza era relied not on his own intelligence, he relied on American intelligence. And he smartly did. It wasn't a stupid thing to do. This Eliza era is like brilliant. And he understood that American intelligence resources in 1973 were many, many, many times stronger than Israel's resources. I can give you an example. I met a man, all these things are finger of God experiences. I met a man who contacted me because he saw that I spelled my name in Hebrew as an acronym. There's a way of indicating that, with, it's called Gershayim. So I spelled it Beit Resh Yud Gershayim Lamed for Brill. And his last name is Brill. So he wanted to know, what's the deal? Why, why do you have Gershayim? Why are you suggesting it's an acronym? So we started talking this and that and this and that. And it turned out that he worked in Israeli intelligence at the time. And he was one of the pioneers of using drones as a means of spying. And this is back in the 70s, the early 70s. What, what did he do? He bought some American remote control toy planes because nothing like that existed in Israel. So he bought these American toy planes and he affixed cameras to them and he sent them across the Suez Canal to take photographs of the Egyptian positions. And he could send them maybe 200 meters across the canal and take some bad photographs and the, and the plane would come back and then, you know, they would process the film and see what's going on. At the same time, at the same time, I saw in NSA photographs of an Israeli army camp in the Sinai where I could read the name of the soldier off of his kippah from our satellites. And it wasn't just like 200 meters from point A to point B. It was, we could see the everything. So of course, Ellie's era was correct in discarding Israeli intelligence points and relying on whatever the Americans told him. Hmm. But he didn't realize that the, the American assessments were false. So when Golda Meir visited Nixon after the war, that was one of her complaints, because she knew that American intelligence gave false assessments to Israeli intelligence. And that's talked about nowhere except in this book. And now we know why. All to fabricate a war, to make political things happen and make everyone, not everyone, certain parties happy uh, in doing so. Hmm. Amazing. Tell us me. Tell me about uh, about somebody you mentioned in the break that we took here, uh, Otis Pike. Tell me about Otis Pike. Okay, I'm fr I grew up on Long Island, and Otis Pike was a congressman from the n n next congressional district uh, east of ours, way out on the island. 
And he, his name was very, very well known in 1975 because he headed the congressional investigation of how money is being misspent to gather intelligence. And one of the things, and th this is the thing that ignited me to, to start probing. In 1975, one of the um, screw-ups of American intelligence was that they said that the Arabs fooled them in 1973. The head of the intelligence agencies, Dr. Ray Klein, testified before Congress, the Otis Pike Commission, and he said, the Arabs fooled us. We had no idea that uh, they were going to attack our ally Israel. Under oath, he lied. Because we knew, I just told you about myself and four other, that's five of us, five of us knew days in advance, some weeks in advance, knew for certainty and knew on what day the attack was going to commence. And here the head of the intelligence agencies testifies lies before Congress that they didn't know. And I've read this, again, by accident, it was kind of the finger of God that I came across this archival New York Times article talking about this in 1975. And I said, what? They didn't know. We knew. We knew. And, and so that bothered me, and it started igniting me to investigate further and further. So what do you hope will become of Deceit of an Ally? What, what do you hope will be the outcome of, of writing this book? Well, that the Jew Room, if, if it still exists, will be sure to be monitored because it's okay to spy on Israel. It's perfectly okay. I see nothing wrong with it. As I said, an Orthodox Jewish girl worked in our section. There's nothing wrong with collecting intelligence, but there is something dead wrong. And I, I, I use that word uh, on purpose, dead wrong in sending misinformation to an ally, especially one that's according to American public opinion and all government expressions, Israel is an ally. So why should certain cells within the intelligence community that are unmonitor unmonitorable work against an ally of America? That's un-American. That's un-American. And so I hope that this can be prevented in the future. And not only that, <laughs> another thing that he talks about toward the end was that after the war, the uh, government that was in power, Golda Meir's government, uh, kind of a leftist uh, government, wanted to get reelected and elections were coming up. And he says that the CIA worked to influence the outcome of the Israeli elections. Well, wow. so it's not a new, it's not a new, a new thing that just came up after Donald Trump, uh, you know, is talking about election fraud. It was something that America did to foreign countries. And it's kind of well documented. It came out in 75 from the uh, Otis Pike Commission investigation that the CIA were tampering with different foreign countries' uh, democ 
democratic elections. Wow. Bruce, thank you for joining us on Shabbat Night Live. Show us that book again and tell us where we can get it. Okay, my book. You can't get, you can't get this one yet. <laughs> Not yet, but, but you're working on that. You will be able to. I'm working on it. But, but this baby took me three years. I, f I felt like I was in a state of pregnancy for three years, and it just gave birth a couple weeks ago. By the way, the first person to get this book was an Amish friend of mine. Very cool. That's a new story. <laughs> well, maybe we'll save that one for another time. So, Bruce, uh, is there a website where we can get that book? Uh, Amazon. Just on Amazon. Okay. Deceit of an Ally That's the only on Amazon. Place right now. All right. That's the only place I can get it. <laughs> Bruce, thank you very much for joining us. This has been an important story to tell. I thank you for your, your bravery and your efforts to do it. And uh, I think uh, everyone who's watching this is, is going to have their eyes opened. So thank you for doing that for us. We appreciate it very much. Shalom, Torah fans. Give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon. And I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research. Be sure to download the new MichaelRood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.